I have a question for you. Do you remember as a little bitty kid, you know, like preschool, kindergarten, your mama worrying and saying, oh my gosh, I forgot to put deodorant on my little kid. Do you remember that? Mm -mm. Me too. Why not? It's because they don't stink or not. Well, <laughs> they can stink for other reasons, but not for sweat, right? So look at chapter or um, slide number 12. This, uh, this is, uh, this photograph, I, I remember seeing it in a, a book that was called The Worst Jobs in the World. Mm -hmm. Pretty bad. So a deodorant tester. <laughs> I mean, if it works, it's not so bad. <laughs> if it doesn't work, uh -huh, that's a whole nother story. So last time, we had been talking about these sudoriferous glands, and we had said we have two different kinds. You got the one, the eccrine glands, that are going to be responsible for um, home, uh, temperature homeostasis. And then we have this other one, and remember we said sudoriferous makes you think of odor. These are the ones, these are the ones that produce the smell, the stink. And these are what we call the, ap the apocrine sweat glands. Now, apocrine sweat glands are scent glands, and they become functional at puberty. That's why mama didn't need to put deodorant on, on you when you were a little, little tyke, right? Um, but there came a time in your life when you say, oh yeah, I better, I better start buying right guard <laughs> or secret like my wife uses, right? Um, and um, it's because you produce this smelly um, substance that's, I guess the idea is it started out as a scent gland, as a, an attractant, you know, uh, boys and girls getting together. Um, I don't find it particularly attractive, but but it, it, it is considered um, a something involved with the um, with sexuality, and um, and I know the activity of the um, of the sweat glands are maybe even tied in with like the men, the female menstrual cycle. Um, so so this kind of sweating, um, you produce this in response to stress and sexual situations. Okay, so buy your deodorant. <laughs> that is the second kind of sudoriferous glands. First one, eccrine, it's, you know, cooling. Second one, apocrine, scent. We have another closely related gland, closely related to this one right here. So this, if you look at the slide, it says it produces a thick, viscous secretion. Well, in your ear, you produce a thick, viscous secretion, earwax. By the way, you can't make a candle out of that. I saw a, <laughs> a Mythbusters where they tried. It's one of the grossest ones I ever saw. They had to collect, collect earwax, um, um, and it didn't work for a candle. Um, but ceruminous glands are a modified apocrine sweat gland. They're found in your ear, and they produce earwax. And so earwax, um, it's found in the external ear canal, and it's, I, I always think of a former student of mine when I see it. I have all kinds of stories for some reason with this with this uh, section of the PowerPoints. Um, but it says cerumen, so ceruminous sweat gland, or ceruminous glands, earwax glands, they produce cerumen. And cerumen is, get this, a sticky, bitter tasting, insect repellent barrier. Bitter tasting. I, I literally, that's no, no joke. I was up in front of class um, at another school in another state, and one of my students, very pretty girl, said, oh, Mr. Mayfield, Mr. Mayfield, is that why urine tastes the way it does? I said, I don't know. I never tasted urine. 
another time, the same student, very pretty girl, ask about the flavor of fingernail polish. So maybe she's the one. Um, anyway, I always think of this girl when I see that sticky, bitter tasting. Who tastes it? I don't. Don't do it. It's icky. Yuck. Um, but anyway, it also is an insect repellent. So it keeps the bugs out of your ear. Who knew? Okay. All right. So, so those are, uh, we didn't talk much about nails, or I didn't talk at all about nails, but nails are very, I just thought I'd mention it here. Um, they're made of the same material as your hair and produced in a similar ma manner um, from the base of your fingernail out. Uh, it's keratinocytes, and it's just there for protection. All right, so going on to slide number 14. So in slide number 14, we are talking about skin color. And um, yeah, so we'll just, we'll cover skin color and then I'll stop because we've got a few minutes here. Um, all right, so with skin color, um, it's different amounts of what? What do you think? I've mentioned it several times today, melanin, right? It's different amounts of melanin. And we had said melanin is produced by melanocytes and it's there to protect your skin. And so depending on where your family history goes, you know, where it goes back to, you have more or less melanin in your skin, more, on, more or less of the chemical melanin in your skin even before you're exposed to sunlight, right? Um, what's really interesting is it's not the number of melanocytes. Every race, you know, if um, I had my, I've always known that I was fair-skinned, of course, but I had my um, DNA checked for ancestry, and it ends up, my ancestry goes back to Finland. Well, so no wonder I'm fair-skinned, but um, if you're from equatorial regions, you're going to have more melanin in your um, secreted by your melanocytes. Now, notice I say how I said that. You are your melanocytes are going to be more active than mine, even before I go out into the sun. Before we go, you know, ex stimulate them. And it ends up that it doesn't matter if you're like me from the north, I mean, my uh, ancestry, or if your ancestry is from the equatorial regions, we all have the same number of melanocytes. It's the difference is how active they are. So, so mine, you know, if I go out in the sun, I, I produce a tan. Uh, if I don't, I'm more white-skinned than um, some other people. But, there, you know, uh, skin color is truly just uh, has to do with the, your, the people you're from and how much exposure you, they've had, routine exposure they had to the sun and, and the amount of melanin secretion that is done even without sun exposure. Um, and we had said that um, melanin is um, there to protect your, your cells. So a darker skinned person has more protection for the DNA in their cells, in their skin, than you and I do. Um, other people have, have sort of a, a more red color to their skin. And we, uh, I had said that redheads have um, iron and sulfur compounds, um, secondary coloring compounds in their hair. And there we have a similar situation with uh, skin pigments. There can be a yellowish cast due to something called keratin. Now, I have here at the bottom, it says uh, in other pigments, we had said carotene, and then there's hemoglobin. Don't let that fool you. Um, when This is that little whitehead kid, you know, me, or, or you know, any little whiteheaded, fair-skinned child. Sometimes they look pink. It's not skin color. You can see through the skin, and you see the blood. 
the hemoglobin, and that's what gives that pinkish cast. Um, freckles. Um, I, I was a little white-haired kid who grew up a lot of my time in Florida. I have a lot of skin damage as a result of that, and so I have freckles. I remember going to this uh, 4-H thing, and they were they were doing an evaluation for precancerous condition in your skin, and people would stick their heads in this um, this viewing box thing, and they'd say, "Oh, that might be one there, that might be one there," you know. Well, I was the Jerry Lewis poster child for skin damage. I'm covered in the stuff. So I have to be very careful about monitoring for skin cancer because I have huge damage to my skin just because I spent a lot of time outside in the South growing up. Um, so that's freckles and tan. Freckles are skin damage. Uh, tanning is this temporary increase in melanin. Um, we have a couple of, of uh, terms, albinism, albinos. All races and many species of animals um, have a, a mutation where they don't produce melanin. And this I taught in Tennessee in, on a campus where there were a lot of these albino squirrels. And what does a squirrel do to hide it? Hugs the tree. Maybe it won't see me, I'll blend right in. No, it doesn't blend in at all. <laughs> but, but, uh, but anyway, there were a lot of these albino squirrels. There's this other uh, definition, vitiligo. That is where you have patches of pigment loss, where you have splotches, white splotches, vitiligo. All right, 12 minutes, time to go. I'll come back and we'll talk some more.